for Tesco it was. That was like the final straw. That was like, no, he he's hit a pig with a plastic stick. This is outrageous. And I was like, this place is one of the worst places in the world. And you're only taking action now because you've seen somebody tap a pig with a plastic stick. Thank you so much for joining us today, Lex. It was such a pleasure to have you on the show. Before we get into this interview, you know, we always like to get to know a bit more about the moments that led us to advocate for animals and planting that proverbial vegan seed. Uh, mm-hmm. We understand that it was your dad's aquarium <laughs> and documentaries such as David Attenborough's Blue Planet, which is fantastic. If you haven't mm-hmm. watched it, why not? Um, yes, <laughs> agree. <laughs> part of uh, the catalyst for you discovering your calling. I would love to know a little bit about that initial vegan journey for you. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to actually be on the show because I have heard, watched some of the previous episodes. So I, I just love the whole vibe of it. But yeah, to answer your question, I guess it kind of really started for me as a kid. I was really heavily influenced by a lot of loud, angry punk music. And I guess in my formative years, soaked up pretty much everything I could from record labels like Epitaph and Fat Records. And it was really when I discovered Propagandy and their kind of animal-friendly, anti-fascist, gay-positive, pro-feminist mantra that I guess it instilled in me those kind of core values and they are very much what are still in me today. And I guess I can credit a lot of what Propagandy sang about and still sing about as my sort of teachings and pretty much taught me everything I know. I still credit them for doing that. And I think uh, even, you know, Chris Hanna just saying, don't eat meat because it's bad. I just was so young and impressionable that I was like, yeah, okay, I'm just going to do what Chris Hanna does because he's the coolest man alive. And that was for me the very start of everything and connected me to something much bigger. I absolutely love that. Um, for myself as a, as a metal and punk fan, like to be honest, I haven't listened to much propaganda, so I know what I'm going to be doing <gasps> after this yeah. interview. Yeah, it's incredible. Is, uh, Honestly, teaches you a lot about life. <laughs> uh, oh, that, that's fantastic! Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I totally get that as well about being influenced. I remember, you know, when I was growing up in the UK, um, Morrissey came out with the whole "meat is mm. murder" in the videos, and it was like, oh, you know, no one's ever told me that before. Well, yeah. That, well, it is, isn't it? So yeah, it just changes everything. And actually, it was it was um, Viva's own Juliet as well, Galetly, that that set me on the road in 1986 Amazing. to becoming vegetarian. So it was, mm-hmm. yeah, it's um, brilliant. It's that uh, it's lovely how we're all sort of connecting, working in this field now. Sea Shepherd are a brilliant organisation who we love and campaign relentlessly for marine life with uh, who you spent several years yourself campaigning with. And in 2015, you were part of Operation Icefish, which was headed for the Southern Ocean, seeking out the fishing vessels illegally, um, which were targeting whales and toothfish in Antarctica. Previously, we had the honor of speaking with the amazing Captain Paul Watson, and uh, he got us so excited for life on this on the high seas, even talking to you this morning and knowing what you've been out there and been doing. You know, we're like, we really want to do that. Unfortunately, <laughs> the two of us have uh, actually got the combined swimming capacity of a bag of bricks. I don't know what happened with either of us. But, you know, we, we live in hope, but we'd love to know more about your experience being part of this campaign and what it was that led you to Sea Shepherd in the first place. Yeah, it's a, honestly, it's such a long story, but it really started with a northern bottlenose whale who was stranded in the River Thames. And this was sort of 2006. I was, I actually professionally trained as a librarian. So at the time of doing a kind of all of my activism, volunteering stuff on the side, I was working full time in a law library in 2006. And I just remember hearing the story about this northern bottlenose whale and just being trapped. And it was kind of this story that just led me to want to, because it was just all about the struggle for this whale. It's not even like technically a real whale, what they call beaked whales. And these are like a really mysterious group of deep divers. And they're rarely seen in the open water, let alone along the River Thames. It was just unheard of for this animal to be stranded in this river in London. And I think what it was that kind of really appealed to me about this animal in particular was that there was like this big rescue operation and they were trying to free this animal. This is one individual animal they wanted to get back to the Atlantic and free from the River Thames. 
And so I was just reading more and more about this and I was just like, well, you know, Wales is still being really heavily persecuted in the Southern Ocean. They were still being targeted. 935 minke whales a year, 50 fin whales, 50 humpback whales. Staggering numbers. It was one country, it was just Japan, that were operating in Antarctica at the time. And I think it just, hearing about this struggle to save this one animal made me want to then go on a journey to save a load more. And I think I was quite naive when I first joined Sea Shepherd because I was like, very much of certainly when I joined the ships like I actually started volunteering on shore and that was all about doing sort of outreach events it was going to dive shows it was going to vegan fairs and I learned how to dive and I was spending more and more time underwater and I went to Mozambique and I was volunteering on a whale shark research project there and during this time in Mozambique I saw my first humpback whale breach from the ocean surface and I was like oh my God, <laughs> this is unbelievable. How do these animals exist? Like, they're just amazing. And I know as animal rights activists, as vegans, we're not technically supposed to have favorite animals. And I know it's very speciesist to have a favorite animal, but there's just something about whales that put me on this path that was like, okay, I really feel like I need to do something. And I was, you know, late 20s at the time, I had a very good job, I had a mortgage, I had, you know, these life plans that didn't really involve just packing a bag and going off to Antarctica and then not really <laughs> coming back for almost, you know, it was over six years, I was there like almost seven years on the ships. But yeah, I just wanted to be a part of something bigger. And so when it was in, we had the International Whaling Commission meet in Jersey and this was 2011 so I just got back from Mozambique at this time as well and I went over to Jersey and I started to join like the protests outside the meeting just say you know whaling's apparent we we should not be whaling 21st century this shouldn't be happening and so it was just me kind of feeling like I needed to do something before it was too late and then I had an incredible opportunity not long after that to then see the Steve Irwin. It passed through the UK on the way back from a Faroe Islands campaign, stopped in London. And I took the opportunity then to go and help on the ship. So I was doing tours and just doing like gangway watches, a bit of security. And it just meant that the crew on board the ship were able to get on with bigger projects. So a lot of the sort of rust chipping and painting and engine prep and all this kind of stuff to get ready to go back to Australia to get ready for the whale defense campaign. And I was just like, I need to do this. I need to go on this ship. <laughs> so I begged and I pleaded. <laughs> I was like, please let me on this ship. I need to come and do this. And I was basically told no to start with, but I was quite persistent. And I was then told if you can get to Australia in five weeks time, you can join the Bob Barker. And I was like, okay, done. I'm going to do everything I possibly can to make this happen. And I was so fortunate that my employers at the time, the University of Sheffield, I was uh, working at this point, still as a librarian. I was just like, can I just go away for like <laughs> five months and you, you keep my job for me and make sure everything's safe when I get back and I can carry on paying my mortgage. I just need to do this one thing. And they were like, yeah, go do it. Get it out of your system, come back. And then you know, we'll pick up where you left off. And I was like, well, okay, when does this ever happen? Never. So I just took that opportunity. And I, five weeks later, was out in Sydney. I joined the Bob Barker 2011. And I was getting ready for, you know, the journey of a lifetime and went to Antarctica on my first whale defense campaign in 2011. And that kind of <laughs> continued. I obviously came back after my five months couldn't really settle again. I think once you've been a part of something and you see the chance to continue doing that thing that you love so much, you, you just make it work. You do absolutely everything you possibly can to make it happen. And again, I went, <laughs> I went back to my uh, manager and I was like, you know, how do you feel about giving me another sabbatical? And they were like, no, <laughs> no, we're not giving you a sabbatical. And I said, well, I, I can't stay. I'm, I'm going to have to go. So I got back in the April 2012 and I left again in the August, went back to the Bob Barker again. It was in Sydney. 
and I just stayed with it pretty much um, on and off. Like we, you tend to do a few months on board, come back for a couple of months. The periods I spent on board got longer and longer. The campaigns got longer and longer. After the first whale defense campaign, I think it was another two. We had zero tolerance. We had relentless. And then we were in this situation where there were ongoing court battles as well. So it was still the Japanese whaling fleet that were going down there. And we were in this unique position where there was all these court cases going on. And then the International Court of Justice ruled against the Institute of Cetacean Research's scientific program. They found that to be unlawful. So we were at this point now where the whaling fleet had said, we're going on hiatus. We're not going to go to Antarctica and kill whales during the 2014-15 season. So Sea Shepherd used that then as an opportunity to switch tactics. And we actually ended up going on this (laughs) epic campaign, what turned out to be, to protect Antarctic and Patagonian toothfish. And it was called Operation Icefish. It was the longest time I've ever spent in sea. It was almost five months. It was a really, I think it was like 146 days straight at sea. And I'm talking for a really long period of time, not seeing land whatsoever. We were operating in some of the most remote waters on the planet. We were like two weeks sailing distance from any port. And we were basically there to just try and find vessels operating illegally And our only kind of, (laughs) before going, the only claim that we made was just, we're going to find these ships and we're going to follow them around for a bit. We're going to report on their location and then hopefully somebody will come and arrest them. (laughs) And it just didn't happen. And so we ended up following this one vessel for 110 days straight. And we were reporting daily. It was a vessel that had an Interpol purple notice issued on it. So it had an arrest warrant. There were people after this ship and we found it within two days of searching for it and this was just something that nobody thought we would be able to achieve we were just like a ragtag bunch of like people there were like 30 of us on this like one ship looking around for it and then we had obviously the second ship the sam simon was there to support us with another sort of 28 crew and then as we were doing the following so we were just tailing this one ship the entire time the Sam Simon crew had the really nasty job of collecting their abandoned fishing gear. So there was about 72 kilometers of wow. gill nets just abandoned in Antarctica, in the Southern Ocean. And yeah, the Sam Simon went and picked a load of it up. And yeah, it was just incredible. It was just, it's really difficult to try and talk about it because so much happened, but then so little (laughs) happened in that whole five months it's like just a period of my life that's disappeared but it we you know we achieved such an incredible feat to even find that ship to start with and then I don't want to give any spoilers away but (laughs) spoiler alert the ship sunk so because they wanted to get rid of the evidence the captain ended up scuttling the vessel off the coast of Sao Tome And so that ship just doesn't exist anymore. And all of the evidence went down with it. So for anybody that's interested in hearing more about that whole story, (laughs) it was actually made into a documentary. The various different Mm -hmm. things have been done about it now. So there's Ocean Warriors, there's Chasing the Thunder. And each of those will just tell you like the whole thing much better than I can really in a Mm -hmm. podcast. (laughs) Wow. Like, oh, I always love these Sea Shepherd stories because (laughs) As, as Jack was saying, we've got the combined swimming ability of a brick, and like we were terrible in the water. But like every time, I'm like, right, where, we where's the boat? We you know? it, yeah. <laughs> and you know, I can totally see you having way up. You know, do I go adventuring to Australia and and you know, hanging out in some of the most remote waters on the planet, or do I stay in the library in Sheffield? You know, yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. And I love libraries, and I love Sheffield, <laughs> but yeah, Antarctica pulled me away from it. Brilliant. But yeah, I love that. And, like that, uh, just the the story of the the whale in in the Thames there. Um, it's fantastic that that calling came to you, and that's the thing when you find your place in advocacy and your place sort of in the animal rights field here. You know that 
that passion is always so strong once you make that connection that it just keeps on driving and yeah i i i'm not surprised at all that it just carried on for so yeah. long and it's just such a wonderful story uh, thank you yeah. so much for sharing that with us and yeah yeah but it was always I, I like sea legs. <laughs> Even, you know, meeting all the crew of the Sea Shepherd ships, like a lot, especially the Australians that are on board, a lot of them have grown up around the ocean. And I always just remember hearing stories from other people of them, like witnessing the problems that were happening in the ocean, the acidification, like the loss of the coral reefs and, and things like this. And I was just like, I'm just some like, kid from Stoke-on-Trent, which is slap bang in the middle of England. I was like, I, it's the potteries industry. There's like no ocean around Stoke-on-Trent. So like, I didn't feel like I ever had this story that connected me to the ocean or to Sea Shepherd as such. But I guess really I did because it started with my dad's aquariums and just being so fascinated by fish as a kid that I was just like, yeah, that like, why wouldn't you want to go and spend time on the ocean and be in this environment and meet a load of incredible people on a really, really just cause? Mm -hmm. yeah well um one of jackie's sons is just about to go traveling and i kept on saying you know Wait, you'd see shepherd sea ships shepherd, you know yes. you like if you want to go see everything you know like yeah. just, just <laughs> <laughs> i want to live through you vicariously you know, tell me what it's like <laughs> uh, oh but yeah that, that's so fantastic and such great insight and um i'm sure there'll be members in our audience today who are who are starting to get their sign up sheets done anyway but oh, um, do it a, do it <laughs> I see they're asking in Australia this as we speak. They're they're asking for for um, volunteers in Australia. So um, so yeah, yeah, check out in your local area because um, as this progresses, there'll be more opportunities. And so yeah, get on that boat. We can't. So do it. Do it. <laughs> we we might. Uh, we might. Maybe one but, day. Yeah. 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 If they want an anchor or something, you know, yeah. substitute anchor, that'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. But um, during a quick interview you did with Joey Carbstrong at Vegan mm -hmm. Campout. Um, you had a discussion that leads towards the idea of how each of us have a different role in the movement, um, where you and Joey shared commonality in being on the cold front of investigations, especially in your role now at Viva. Um, it's our hope that through the series, our audience can find their own individual voices if they haven't found them already um, and find a role that suits them as an individual and then also their skills. Yeah. So what was it that led you to start conducting and coordinating investigations? It's a really difficult one because I think, again, it's just something I kind of fell into, I suppose, because I was with Sea Shepherd for a long time and I have now such a varied experience of things. And I think even with Sea Shepherd, I always tried to fill a gap. So if I saw that there was a skill that was missing... I would try and be the person to kind of learn how to do that and just roll with it. So, for example, we were always struggling for welders and I lived in the Steel City. So I, after my first campaign, I, I went back home to Sheffield and started night school and actually learned how to weld. So I could go back to the ship and say, hey, look, I'm a welder now. Like I can help you do all the welding jobs that are needed doing. And I think what was really good about being on the ship is I had a role where I was very kind of hands-on, so I would do a lot of welding. But then coming from my information management background, I am so incredibly organized to the point of, like it just infuriates most people around me because everything is so neat and tidy and organized and I'm good at time management and I'm good at prioritizing. And so I started to manage the ship. So I had this really good mix of jobs and I could be hands-on doing one thing and be like right in the grit of it getting down and dirty which I love doing but then I was also using like my professional skill to actually feel like I was helping and developing some strategies processes and putting things in place to help make jobs easier for people and when you're with Sea Shepherd it is a very transient lifestyle so I spent a long time living out of a bag not really being able to commit to many things. I had friends that were getting married and I was like, oh God, I'm going to miss this wedding. I'm so sorry, but I've got to do this thing. And then, you know, my nan fell ill and I really just wanted to be at home to be there for when my nan needed me. My family was struggling with me being away a lot and I was just taking a break and I happened to see a job advertised for Viva. They were looking for a campaigns manager and I was like, whoa, like, I, I love Viva. <laughs> like, I remember getting all the Viva leaflets like 
from when I first went vegan as well. And I just remember thinking, like reading the job description and just thought, I could probably do this. And the great thing about the job was it mixed a lot of those transferable skills I had from working in libraries. It was a lot of like project management, budget management, sorting out spreadsheets, that kind of stuff. But then it also gave me the chance to actually be out on the streets and talking to people and doing outreach and sharing my experiences and, you know, talking to people about how (laughs) great vegan food is and just how wonderful all these animals are that we can save if we stopped eating them. So it was just really that that appealed to me. And I think as I have been it, you know, as I grew into the role at Viva and I've been there now for four and a half years, it because the job became a lot bigger. So we've got like huge campaigns around. We've also got huge investigation projects. And so I kind of went more down the investigation side because I have a background in researching for, you know, and teaching research skills and that kind of thing. Like anyone who knows Viva's work knows that your investigations and your campaigns are absolutely huge. And one of the many things that we love about Viva is your dedication to not just presenting the truth, but actually going in and uncovering it through these investigations. And often when we first think of investigations, the mind sort of pictures people scaling fences, sneaking into farms at the crack of dawn and catching all those nasty abusers in the act. But I understand that while that may be occasionally part of the story, which is very cool, it's not the whole picture. Would you mind sharing with our audience some of the different types of investigations that you or your team might enact and the variety of methods that you take um, to conduct them? Yeah, so surprisingly, a lot of investigation work starts at the computer and I spend an awful amount of time trawling things like farming forums to try and get some kind of insight into different activities that are taking place or to try and get a better understanding of why certain things happen on farms. So you can spend a lot of time like digging around industry type websites. You can, you know, spend days reading about standards and regulations for farmed animal welfare. You can be trying to connect all the dots in the food system. So we often talk about being able to trace our the, the products you buy in the supermarket from farm to fork. Well, that is actually a lot easier said than done. And it is very, very difficult to make that connection as just, you know, a, a consumer wanting a bit more information. It's really, really difficult to find out what farm a packet of bacon in Tesco say. So, you know, where's it come from? I've got this product in my hand. Where's it come from? So I spend a lot of time trying to get to the bottom of that. I can spend time submitting freedom of information requests. Often these fail. So it's then a matter of like rewording my questions and resubmitting and then appealing and going through those kind of long bureaucratic paper processes you know, tweaking various different things. I spend a lot of time on planning portals, looking for information and statements that have been put forward with different planning proposals. Then, you know, there's a lot of logistics involved. So when we actually want to carry out an investigation, say we have a target, there's a lot of logistics. So it's getting a team together that have the skills that, you know, we need, we might need somebody that can do hidden cameras, we might need somebody that's really good at taking photographs we might need somebody that's like a star on the videography so it depends what we need and what it is we're looking for and you know often we don't we don't actually know that before we even start so you can kind of get your team together to do a few recce's and then just think okay well this area is particular of particular interest let's focus on that and then I can spend you know days on end (laughs) sometimes it feels like reviewing footage piecing together images, putting together like a whole package for the media and pitching these stories. It's an incredibly frustrating process to even try and release an investigation. And, you know, and then you've got all the sort of back and forth with the journalists answering questions day and night, providing any kind of evidence that they're looking for. So there's a lot. And, you know, I do spend a lot of time as well responding to these ridiculous denials that you get where, you know, you've released an investigation, then you've got the owner saying, oh, well, that's not my fault. Uh, and, you know, I'm like, well, actually it is. And here's all the proof. So uh, 
shut up now so you could be like there's just so animals are happy yeah yeah our animals are happy here and I'm like mm, I don't think so so yeah there is a lot involved and a, a lot is spent at a computer and not necessarily scaling fences which is part of it as well but yeah the majority is is quite dull in comparison I suppose is what I'm it's getting amazing at. Him. it's not all glamorous yeah. It's amazing how much you can get done from behind the computer. Yeah. And I, I must, um, you know, do you get much help from, you know, whistleblowers or people that are in those industries? Um, because I know um, we have Farmwatch over here and it's incredible how many people are, are trapped in those industries and get in touch to sort of say, look, this is going on or I'm desperate to get out, but I'm fearful what will happen if I try and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, do you get much sort of contact with those people? Do they sometimes come and approach you and say this is happening, you know? The vast majority of our investigations start with a tip off. Yeah. And usually that, you know, that can be a really sort of small thing. Like we had one in 2020. We do, I just had somebody call the office one day and say, I've been on a dog walk. I've passed this pig farm. There's a lot of screaming. There's a lot of banging around of crates like metal. And, you know, my first thought is when people say that, my first thought is, you know, pigs make noises and yeah there's metal cages that they're in it doesn't necessarily warrant an investigation so it was a breeding facility that had a few hundred sows and they were basically pumping out 400 piglets a week and these piglets were going off to then a rearing facility somewhere else but whilst they were actually loading some of those piglets into one of the vehicles for transportation they were doing what they call thumping. And this is when they take a, you know, a piglet that's probably not the right size or it's sick, and they essentially kill them by blood force trauma. And it's where a worker will just swing the pig round in a big arc over the head and basically slam the heads into the floor. And this is completely legal. Like this is the standard practice on pig farms. But it is so shocking for the public to see that, that when we put that investigation out, when we released the expose, there was just this outcry about this practice that was happening because people didn't know about it. And it was also a farm that had an incinerator on site. And there was a lot of dead pigs and sows and piglets going into this incinerator. And there were times when the investigators went to this farm, and the door was just left wide open and there was it was like in the middle of the most beautiful woodlands. And so you'd got a lot of wildlife coming back and forth onto the farm and they were feeding on, you know, all this horrible <laughs> stuff that was in this incinerator. So in my mind, I'm like, okay, we've got a big story here because a pandemic's hit and we've got this farm that's just like spreading disease, just like that. It's just right there, like wide open and this is what is going to be the story. But it wasn't like the journalist was not interested in that aspect of it. They were more interested in, rightly, they were more interested in the fact that these piglets are being killed in this in this way. And I was like, well, you know, this is potentially a violation of standards here that they've got this open incinerator. <laughs> and then this is standard practice. And they're like, well, no, we're going to go with this story of standard practice because it's so horrific. And I was like, yeah, it is horrific. Like, I'm really glad actually that you've taken that line. And a year later, the farm has been demolished. So <laughs> this expose led to a huge embarrassment. The farm was, there were tenant farmers on a big shooting estate. And so because they'd had all this national media attention and it was, you know, just constant, like all the stories about it. It was just, it was so big that they decided to then end this tenancy and the farm closed. And a year later, we went back and we actually saw the process of the farm being demolished. And it was really amazing because we were able to match a shot. So we got the original investigation footage and we went back with the shot list to then show what it was like a year later. And it was just like, wow, like investigations really do work. And they can have an impact when they're kind of done <laughs> done like this. So it was a really, really positive step to see that kind of thing happen as a, a response to our work. Yeah, That's absolutely fantastic. And it's awesome. I um I kind of want to jump back to the whole thing of, you know, spending a lot of time researching on some of the, the forums and the official sort of things. And that's the thing with it being a, a standard practice, the thumping. Um, it's one thing that for any of our activists at home who you know, are more homebound, you know, you're not able to go out as much. 
if that is something that interests you doing some of that research and going on to some of these pages, mm. yes, you're going to deal with a lot of stuff that's going to conflict with your ethics, you know, reading this. But that's the thing. If you can discover some of these points, which are standard practice, which are just absolutely brutal, exactly. they are fantastic points to leverage when brought into the right light. And then for this uh, whole because this was the was this the Winterbrook uh, Farm Partners? It and was Marston indeed. Campaign. Yeah, yeah. Um, which you can read more about on the Vivo website, you know, to see the full um, investigation. But for that to be tipped off by you know a dog walker, it goes to show yeah, how much of an influence each one of us can have by just simply noting something like that. And yeah. I will admit, yeah, as vegans, we're probably more inclined to be. Uh, see it as m maybe more extreme than the general public, you know, but just hearing those noises because we understand more what's going on, yeah. or at least we think we understand what's going on over there. But um, yeah, for all of us, you know, if you see something happening or you have friends or family who see things happening, tell them to mm. write it down, send it, send yeah. it through. Not to don't totally bombard <laughs> legs, please. Like make, yeah. make a job a bit easy, but um, you know, we're like, <laughs> using we're using the dairy industry actually. When you were saying about the thumping, you know, obviously we can't. Uh, you, you can't pick up a, a 25, 30 kilo calf or whatever and do that. But, you know, so many calves are routinely killed here in New Zealand and mm. no doubt in other countries in the world through blunt force trauma as well. And it's a routine yeah. thing. If somebody's not thriving or a bit small or not going to, yeah. you know, not deemed to be worth anything, that is is quite routine. So um, just yeah, imagine if exactly. more of the public knew about this, uh, what the outcries would be. And it's great to yeah. see the power of the individual and the power of the public. Definitely. And it's so, you know, as well, we also get tip offs from ex workers. Like, I do, they're generally, if they're generally the ones that I get back to quicker because it seems they've always got like a, a reason for it. They've seen something that warrants an investigation a lot of the time. So, when I do hear from ex workers, that they tend to be the ones I'll just try and pick the phone up straight away and be like, you know, can I have a chat with you? I feel like I've got a lot of questions and you need to be really delicate and sensitive they've obviously gone through something terrible and they're coming to a vegan organization they're trusting you with that information and they're trusting you to protect them as well you know they've got to stay as like a confidential informant and so it's been really helpful and I've learned a lot from people in that have come to me from a farming background as well and you know I do get the opportunity to ask a lot of questions that you know, I, I, sometimes I just can't find the answer to when no matter how much Googling I do. So, yeah, we are very lucky that we do get a very, very wide range of tip offs. And that's usually where the investigations start for us. Yeah, I suppose um, having an actual industry inside just gives that legitimacy to the, the the claims and stuff like that. And I know for Jackie, you are having the dairy industry experience, you know, it means that um, to use the carnist metaphor, pulling the wool over the eyes. I don't know what the vegan one for that, pulling the... Um, I'm always trying to find with the <laughs> pineapple anyone leather. Who, yeah, put the pineapple, pineapple leather just, over yeah, the yeah. eyes. You know, like um, they can't do that. And for anyone who watches this show regularly will know that I'm always searching for the um, the vegan versions of all these sayings. But you know, oh, that's yeah. the thing. It gives it that legitimacy yeah. um, to those sort of claims. And yeah, it's great to have that. And also connecting with people who've been in these industries, you understand more of the conditioning that goes on and so mm -hmm. much stuff that wasn't, or they might be in that moment, but they're not yeah. present in that moment. And so um, mm -hmm. then when the horror comes uh, later on, often, you know, you just see people get destroyed by what they've been part of. And, you know, we've got to work with these people to dismantle the industry as opposed mm -hmm. to working against them, you know, because that's the thing. If someone wants to help speak out, we need to work with them and not just shut them down for having been part of it. You Absolutely. know, I know it's hard for us. You know, we care so much for the animals, but in these cases, you know, humans are an animal as well. And so, yeah, if we can help work together, collaborate, one of our core things here at VNFT is collaborate with people so that then we can get the greater result for the animals. So, yeah, it's fantastic. Um, and I think we've kind of covered this a little bit already, but when you're going into these sort of situations, you know, and you're getting these tip-offs, is it a case of, you know, you you try and go in with a predetermined idea of what you're trying to mm -hmm. uncover or is it just the case of yeah once you get there then um the target reveals itself yeah i try not to start any investigation with some kind of predetermined idea of what i want the outcome to be because it's like i said with the carvesley farm investigation 
after I'd put it all together, my my initial thought was like, oh, the only way the media is going to pick up on this is if we take a pandemic angle with the spread of disease because of the incinerator. And like, although in my heart of hearts, I wanted it to very much be the thumping of the piglets. I'd, I'd never thought it was going to be. So I was very surprised when the media took that angle from it. So I think stories develop and you can never go go into something saying, okay, we're going to do an investigation and this is what the outcome is going to be because it just never works like that. You have to let the kind of story come to you. You have to, you know, be aware that you've got to do a lot of poking around in these places and then seeing what is of interest. What doesn't, what doesn't look quite right there? Where do I want a camera to be? Where am I going to get interactions of people with the animals because we found and again this I think you've already spoke to Juliet about this but certainly with the Hogwood campaign when that first investigation happened in 2017 they got some of the most horrific footage that had ever been revealed in on a British pig farm but neither Tesco nor Red Tractor nor any uh, trading standards nobody with any kind of authority or any power or any of the businesses acted nobody said to Hogwood Farm what you're doing here is not okay and so when I started Beaver I came in sort of 2018 and we were sort of like oh my god this like huge investigation happened and we've done all these days of actions and you know big business is not taking any action on it what what more can we do and we had all these discussions about going back and you know (laughs) we ended up going back in 2018 and 2019 And then the only time Tesco actually did something, Red Tractor actually did something, was following that investigation in 2019 where we'd left cameras and we'd got the interaction of the farmer with the pigs and, you know, hitting them with hand tools, having this slapstick. And again, like, I know that as an animal rights activist, I I, I see anybody touch an animal in a way that they shouldn't. And I'm like, this is outrageous this should not be happening but I was looking at some of this footage from Hogwarts and I was like this guy's just got a plastic stick that he's like you know just tapping this pig with to move the pig out the way is that really that bad compared to everything that we've seen before now but for Tesco it was that was like the final straw that was like no he he's hit a pig with a plastic stick this is outrageous and I was like this place is one of the worst places in the world. And you're only taking action now because you've seen somebody tap a pig with a plastic stick. But at the same time, I'm just like, yeah, okay, whatever. (laughs) Whatever gets us to that end, that's fine by me because those animals were suffering appallingly. And whatever action can be taken, I am grateful that it was taken. And it, it doesn't matter to me now that it was because we got the handling footage or, you know, those horrific scenes from 2017. It was, you're right, we, we did speak to Juliet uh, a little while back and I remember doing some research and I was listening to a speech of hers. I think it may have been a vegan camp out or something that she was giving, mm-hmm. but she said about the results and about Tesco and Red Tractor and everybody, you know, finally for whatever reason deciding, <laughs> yeah. you know, to, to dump Hogwood Farm. And I was walking along the street at the time listening to a podcast of, of Juliet and I was bawling my eyes out just listening to it. You know, what, what you've achieved is just incredible and it really – you know, it's like with the whole Sea Shepherd thing, but it just wakens something up in you. It's just like you can really be a part of something Absolutely. amazing and you really can create change. And to, yeah. there must be no feeling like it than to see these places, you know, be, be yeah. shut down. And for any of our viewers out there listening, um, you know, who do resonate with the idea of taking part in this crucial field of activism, have you got any advice for getting in- involved apart from, you know, trying to get a job at the local library and <laughs> see where you go from there? <laughs> Yeah, just wing it. (laughs) Just absolutely wing it. Um, I guess really, like, my kind of key advice to people is don't be reckless because I think, like, a lot of people just rush straight into things and it's not worth the additional risk to either yourself or the animals that you're trying to protect by doing something silly. And we need people in the vegan movement that have some longevity to them. So you need to be able to sometimes just, you know, take a step back and think about what your strategy is. 
and not just rush in because you think that you can help a few animals now rather than a lot more later. And for anybody that's, you know, even thinking of rescuing animals, that's incredible. But make sure you've got a home for them because there's no point rescuing animals if you cannot provide a safe forever home where they're going to be free from harm. And I think that, you know, when people first get into animal rights and first start any kind of campaign work, they, they tend to want to try and, you know, myself included, I tend to try and rush things because I want to see some kind of like, I don't know, like success straight away or some kind of victory straight away or a small win straight away. But we don't get that in the vegan movement. We have this really long struggle that's going to take us a really long time to get to that end goal of having a vegan world and making sure that animals are no longer exploited for any reason whatsoever. So I think, yeah, just just don't be reckless. <laughs> and then just start small, start with a local group, talk to a lot of people, figure out what skill it is that you can have, that you can bring to a campaign. You know, I remember myself going to a talk at Vegan Camp Out and she was a filmmaker and she had made like a lot of short documentaries. And one of the things that really resonated with me and what she was saying was that, you know, she wanted to be an animal rights activist, but she didn't really know how she could do that or what kind of skills she had. But she was a filmmaker and made an incredible documentary about the dairy industry. And so it was just being able to recognize what skill you have and how you can contribute to animal rights or to the vegan movement in that way. So, yeah, for me, it was kind of being a librarian. <laughs> but this is where I ended up. So, yeah, you know, it can be anything and everything really, can't it? <laughs> Yeah, well, that's fantastic. And there's something I always like to say is, you know, if you're going to be a militant vegan, be a strategist, <laughs> because that's the thing. If you, yeah, I say if you rush into it, you're, you're likely to cause more harm to yourself and others, you know, and especially yeah. the animals. And um, we've seen so many cases of, you know, places where it's like rescues in particular, where people have rushed in and they've had that of that commitment of their the compassion that they they want to save these animals but in the long run there's been a lot more problems that have cropped up because they mm -hmm. rushed into it and they didn't have that network set up but hopefully for our viewers of this series you're finding activists you resonate with um i'm re I, i'm resonating right now you know I, I kind of i'm like can i change tact in what i'm doing here but um <laughs> you know like find someone you resonate with and find a field that suits you because yeah um some way you can really plan out and we've yeah. got a lot of battles to fight in the vegan movement that we're gonna have Absolutely. a lot of fear, like a lot of losses a lot of fear sort of victories where you know we're battered and yeah. bloody by the end of it you know we may only just scrape through at the end but it's about winning this this sort of war although mm -hmm. as a peaceful movement it's not really war what is it i don't know winning this campaign yeah um, but i tell you something yeah. as well just to pick up on that if you're gonna go into a vegan business and say you're gonna open a restaurant can you please start opening on a Monday? Like, why are vegan businesses always closed on a Monday? And it's just like, mm. I still want to eat on a Monday. So, like, do your research around the area. Like, if you're going to open a food outlet, please, please open on a Monday. I need you to open on Mondays. Uh, on. I love that. Yeah. It's so true, actually. Build it into your activism strategies. Lunch is on Mondays. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah no that, that's so lovely and um yeah hopefully that's resonating with our audience and i resonate with me and uh, that's the message that we we have here in the activist series and that's something we really try and instill every time is that you've got to find your your place in activism and find your own strategy and build up for the greater good so yeah. um yeah love that answer but yeah. um we've really started talking about some of viva's incredible campaigns and one ongoing one is the end factory farming uh, mm -hmm. Before it ends us campaign, which is exposing a whole range of species and the cruelty involved in their farming processes. Uh, this campaign so far has featured pig farms, broiler chickens, uh, Christmas turkeys, uh, rainbow trout, and salmon farms. Mm -hmm. A key aspect that stands out to me, though, is uh, the exposing of not just the inherent cruelty uh, that come from these farms, but also the links with that food chain, which once again, mm -hmm. we sort of we've touched on this before making supermarkets and the public face this industry and make sure it's been held accountable for what they're doing. And as we've said before as well, it's case <laughs> they pick up on the funny, not not the funny things, but the, the things that we would consider lesser rather than the greater issues. Yeah. Um, and so 
is creating the link with the public uh, points of sale, you know, and and these farms, one of the key considerations when doing these projects. So yeah, making sure that we're picking ones that we can make that point of sale connection. Yes. So I think what people tend to be looking for, or they tend to look for a way to deny what they're doing. So for example, you could release a chicken farm investigation. You can show these horrendous conditions inside a broiler shed. And you can have somebody say, oh, that's not in the UK. We've got the highest animal welfare standards in the world. That's not happening here. And you're like, well, actually it is. This is taken from a UK chicken farm. Or they'll say, oh, but I, I get my chicken from Morrison's. That's a Tesco farm. And just any opportunity people have to deny that they're a part of this appalling food system, they'll just take it. So it is really important for us to create those links with supermarkets, because, again, like I was saying, you know, you need to be able to go into a store, pick up a, a you know, packet of chicken breasts and be like, OK, where did this chicken live? How did it live? how far has it traveled, all that kind of stuff. People should be able to find out that information. And a lot of the time they can't. The best way of, tra you know, the best system we have for tracing things is just the, the egg industry, for example. They need every single egg in UK supermarkets has to be stamped with a code that indicates what farming system they've come out of, whether it be free range barn or cage. I mean, we don't even have free range anymore because of the bird flu pandemic happening it's been the worst winter on record for us here so all of our free range eggs have gone they're all barn reared now because the birds have been inside for so long but yeah people need to take responsibility and if we're able to do an investigation of a particular farm and then say these pigs end up in tesco like we did with hogwood then it, it makes it a lot easier for people to make that connection they don't necessarily act on it and you know start to say or question okay i'm, I'm not going to eat pigs anymore it'll just be well i'm not going to eat pigs from hogwood anymore so then you're like well it's not just pigs from hogwood it's pigs from calvesley it's pigs from white shoots it's all these other pig farm investigations we're trying to show that cruelty is inherent across the board. And we do that with every species we possibly can that are farmed in this country. And it's been really good for us in the last sort of couple of years because we started to bring fish onto the agenda. And I've had like an incredible opportunity to go up to Scotland and I've been taking part in investigations there on factory fish farms. And it's just a topic that we know very little about and people don't talk about. And then we're trying to do... And again, I think you might want to ask this later, but some of the things that we're working on at the moment is about the sea lice issue with salmon and trout on intensive farms and the impact that these infestations of parasitic sea lice are having, not just on the fish that are confined in these disgusting, like putrid cages that are essentially aquatic factory farms, but the wider environment as well, the impact that these infestations of sea lice are having on wild populations of salmonids and you know the create it's just a disaster the whole thing is a disaster and so i think yeah the end factory farming campaign is trying to cover a lot of issues but certainly we're trying to make the public take a bit of responsibility and take some ownership of the problems that they're causing by continuing to eat a lot of this stuff as well mm, yeah we often like to say the whole thing of you know getting people to join the dots well this is a putting permanent sort of points on then you you can't just miss out the rest of them this is linked this is the chain get to, you know, it's, yeah it's fantastic and people will always i think search for recognition that what they're doing is okay mm -hmm. um i remember a couple of years ago gareth and i went on a um a cruise through the um Marlborough Sounds, Queen, Queen Charlotte Sounds, oh, which is yes. where some of our country's biggest um, salmon farms are. Mm. And, you know, we were around the most beautiful scenery we'd ever seen. And then all of a sudden we come across these salmon farms and the smell was just hideous, absolutely yeah. hideous. And it just, it looked horrible. There were seals that were hanging all around trying to get into the salmon farm. And like mm. you're saying, I'm kind of thinking, well, won't it be not very good for the seals eating this this fish either? Like it's not, yeah, yeah. it just, it kind of put a bit of a... Um, put a dampener on the trip. Yeah. And this is the thing, we're, we're sort of like looking at it and be like, 
why is this here? You know, like why is this even existing in the first place? And everyone yeah. else on the on the boat there is just like, oh look, look, there's seals. Oh, there's salmon. Yeah, you know, exactly. oh, this is all lovely. You know. And I was like, yeah. I used to eat that salmon in my pre-vegan days. That was, I thought, top quality salmon back then, you know. And this is where, yeah, yeah. I was I was blown away. So yeah. it's, it's being confronted with it, you know. You can't really. Um, I love the name of the, the campaign, actually, uh, License to, to Kill, <laughs> like lice. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. go check it <laughs> yeah. out on the Viva website. There will be links with this, you know, yeah. um, to read more about that because, yeah, it's just oh my god it makes my skin crawl i must say like yeah. the, the lice things <laughs> yeah, yeah definitely it's, it's so great that you're covering this and within the, the broiler chicken investigation i know um viva targets three farms i think contributing to mm -hmm. um is it avara foods hook two sisters sorry they're foreign names to That's me all right. <laughs> mm -hmm. park i believe who are all Correct. major suppliers to uh uk supermarket chains tesco say sainsbury's Lidl, is that how you say yeah, it? Pretty much Lidl. all of the supermarkets. Yeah, Lidl. Yeah, so they're the three biggest produ like poultry producers in the country. So they are pretty KFC. much found in every single, yeah, every single supermarket and obviously fast food chains as well. So, oh, it's, um, yeah, I don't know. It's, you know, it, it, there's got to be change. Is it your hope that by targeting these larger corporations, um, supply lines, you know, we can create that system, systematic change um, as opposed to just, you know, individual reform, which is great as well. But, you know, we, mm -hmm. we want to grow it, don't we? Get it across the whole system. Yeah, absolutely. It's really difficult because I think that when you're working in a campaigning sphere to do with, animal you know you've come from an animal rights background so my fundamental belief is animals should not be exploited for any purpose whatsoever but then at the same time that's not going to happen overnight and I can be quite pragmatic about that and I recognize a need for welfare improvements I don't really like to think of myself as a welfareist as such I'm not advocating for bigger cages I want the end of all cages I want animals to be free but yeah, like I said, it's not it's not going to happen overnight. So the way we try and campaign is to make these kind of incremental changes. But we're also trying to make the public take responsibility. We're a con consumer focused first and foremost, and we're trying to get people to choose vegan over these terrible, terrible industries that kill billions of animals every single year. I think um, you can go back to as well that whole example again of getting people to when they see like oh this this Hogwarts bacon you know I'm not going to eat that anymore because they've seen the the issues of the welfare there you know that's just you know it's as much as we want it all to stop you know just getting them to open that door you know makes them realize yeah. that you know there is an issue of welfare and then cruelty in the larger scheme and so yeah it's that's the thing we you know we are abolitionists here as well and we really want that you know but we are going to have to engage in welfare campaigns you, have to be you know as well, yeah, don't you? <laughs> to, to make that happen you know and yeah it, yeah it all starts somewhere and so even if we can stop one farm at a time that that is fantastic there's still hundreds yeah. if not thousands of animals um we've been talking with the vegan land movement recently and how they've been stopping uh farms expanding and mm -hmm. removing uh, plots of land and farm purchases uh, from the market pretty much Wow! and they they do some fantastic work and we'll hopefully have her on uh, Gina um, on this series later mm -hmm. but it's just fantastic to see that you know by stopping one you know they, they estimate it may be like 200,000 chickens on it you know but then wow. that's just for one cycle you know yeah. that's just one cycle that that's not the next breeding lot that's not all the ones who die in between that then they replace and it's yeah. just amazing what can be done. Um, yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. So yet another one of your brilliant campaigns is, you know, even even, even though we can't be there to watch Channel 4 ourselves <laughs> in person, being stuck here on the other side of the world, yeah, everyone is, has seen has been talking about, you know, your massive new TV ad campaign launch in the UK, reaching the general public like never before. Mm -hmm. So exciting. We were just, yeah, hugely excited to see about that. Would you mind sharing with our audience a bit about the uh, the Viva's Take Away the Meat campaign? Yes. So we had the idea. We've already done a cinema ad. So we, we're not this isn't the first time we've created an ad like this to try and push the vegan message out there, but it is the first time we've taken that to 
the TV screen. And it was to Channel 4 and its associated networks, which in the UK is like one of our four main channels. Like Channel 4 is huge to be on. So it was really big for us to kind of get this reach anyway. And we did the most incredible crowdfund campaign to first of all, get the money to put the together and then to get the money for the distribution of it. And our supporters were just phenomenal, like in getting us that money to be able to do this. But the ad, it's only, it's like 30 seconds. It goes really quickly, (laughs) but it obviously takes a lot of time filming, a lot of time prepping and planning and doing all that kind of stuff. But it was really, again, just this subtle nudge, very, it was not graphic in any way. And it focused on a young meat eating couple that were sat on the sofa with their dog having a nice Friday evening in whatever. And they were ordering a takeaway on an app called Just Meat, which is like a clever play on a food delivery company here called Just Eat. So for any, it's like already tapping into mainstream by being just meat instead of just eat. But anyway, so a little time later, the door goes and this piglet is at the threshold with a guy with a meat cleaver. And he's like, "Uh, fresh meat delivered straight to your door, whatever, because they were after pulled pork. And so they're kind of then just like really taken aback and confused and like, oh, we ordered pulled pork. Why is this like adorable little piglet turned up to the door? And it's just this like little nudge to get people thinking about the face behind their food, to think about where their food comes from and whether they'd be able to take the life of an animal that comes to the door in order for them to have something to eat. And then it kind of cuts there and it goes to the whole, you know, it doesn't have to be this way. You can choose vegan instead. And we've got the link to the Viva website on there. And it was just amazing because like the first time it aired, it aired in the middle of a Jamie Oliver uh, cookery show. I don't know if you know who Jamie Oliver yes, is. Yes, we know Jamie. Yeah. He's a pretty big deal. <laughs> and I think just before the ad aired, because it was the first ad on the ad break, and just before they'd actually been cooking some pig meat, and then it goes boom straight into this beaver advert that's like promoting veganism and it was so good and i was so happy to see it finally get like this mainstream coverage it was incredible and what i am most kind of pleased about the whole thing is we often whenever viva do billboard campaigns or whenever we do any kind of advertising there are always complaints and it's the Advertising Standards Authority that people tend to go to to make these complaints. And it's just like, we were at it again. They're making all these bold statements. They can't back it up with fact. And we do, but we often lose the, <laughs> these um, like investigations that the advertising agencies do into our billboards or whatever. And it's always like on the most like ridiculous point that they're pulling us up on. And it's just like, you said all cancer instead of some cancer and things like that. And, you know, okay, fine, we can change the wording of stuff, but we we don't tend to win these battles. So when we aired the TV ad, like, of course, we were going to get complaints about it. We actually ended up with 402 complaints about it. And the most amazing thing is the Advertising Standards Authority came back and said, we are not going to investigate a single one of these complaints. And we think that adverts meets all of our standards. And I was just like, this never this never happens. This is like such a victory. Not only have we got this advert showing on like prime time, huge channel, we've also now got the Advertising Standards Authority saying, yeah, you know what? They were absolutely fine and what they said, it's right. And we're like, hell yes like finally <laughs> victory it was so good it's such a good feeling that is brilliant, brilliant yeah it's uh, this awesome and it shows the scale of, of your, your support as well you know how mm. much back you've got from from your loyal followers and supporters because we know yeah. um you know we know all too how well. hard it is what yeah. a struggle it is just to get even amazing vegan films out there into mm-hmm anywhere you know (laughs) just to get anybody to be able to see them it's such a struggle so it's it's a a massive massive achievement Uh, like as a filmmaker myself you know even getting that 30 second clip together you know is there's so much work that goes behind the scenes in order to make that happen and although yeah it may be blink of the eye on the tv you know it might be whilst Mm -hmm. you're trying to make your your cup of tea um you know it's still just yeah it's just a huge thing getting that on tv a lot of us you know um we've had a lot of discussions with people and they're like oh we should just chuck an ad on tv it's like <laughs> no that, it's that, so that, expensive mm-hmm. yeah 
it is mental like um yeah. how how big it is and uh, like for us out here we've had uh, milk release uh recently which hopefully mm. people have seen it's up on the plant-based news uh youtube it's also on water bear media um jackie even played a part of it we did a lot longer interview for it but um there was uh <laughs> yeah jackie has her line in it which is fantastic we, we liked um, uh, a bit of F- fda in it but uh, it's a fantastic documentary uh called milk and um they've had such a struggle out here again anything on tv because of course since it challenges dairy the media out here won't touch it. TVNZ mm-hmm. won't touch it. Um, and it's such a shame that they just still have been denied that. And, you know, we've seen from them yeah. just the struggle to get things on TV out here. And just we're just so happy when uh, Viva, yeah, you guys got that out there. And there's also, I believe it's, is it called Oracle System? There's another great um, mm-hmm. like cinematic ad that is on the Viva website. Uh, once again, there'll be links to it go check it out because it is a fantastic piece of um editing and especially um after effects and all the yeah. <laughs> already uh, video nerds like myself as well be like oh that's a really cool technique i love that <laughs> but um it's great to see what you're doing and this is uh, one of the instances where it hasn't been so harrowing the imagery you know with this mm-hmm. ad you know and a lot of them yeah. when you see what happened in hogwood um there's a documentary for that go watch that too folks um so much of the investigations there's so much i I don't understand i I don't know how you can deal with that i deal with a lot of graphic footage but just seeing Mm -hmm. some of the stuff that comes out wow you know uh seeing the psychology behind it i still ask myself you know like wow (laughs) like how do you get through that um but you know we've spoken about this a lot between jackie and i and how different forms of media affect different people um in different yeah. ways and for me as a video editor i can read things and they will really affect me whereas you know despite just saying you know i can look through a lot of graphic footage and it won't affect me half as much it'll affect jackie you know mm-hmm. like for her as a writer um the imagery works better as opposed to for me like the writing um works mm-hmm. better and get me to connect with things and so um we understand uh, you're very much an advocate for bringing in a personal element wherever possible. And with these actions, you know, trying to get them to resonate with more people. Um, would you like to elaborate more on this sort of the approach of sort of bringing your personal connection to the the mediums in which you put forward and like why it's so important to have that connection to it? Yeah, I think a lot of the time you need multi kind of faceted strategies to things so it's like you said you've got to be able to resonate for the different things for people so like for example if you're very visual you know you might be impacted by something that you see I struggle a lot with smells Um, I don't have a great sense of smell and it's always really funny because like you know people are like oh do you smell that I'm like no I can't can't smell anything so if I get like a really strong smell I know it's terrible so I can have like the odd whiff of thing and it can like bring a whole load of memories flooding back to me but then also like certain sounds of stuff so for example when I was doing a lot of the whale defense campaigns the Japanese whaling fleet used to use these long-range acoustical devices against us. And essentially, it's just like a really, really loud, high-pitched alarm, and they're supposed to induce nausea. And for a long time after coming back from the campaign, I could be like in an electrical store, and I've picked up a camera, and I've pulled maybe a little bit too hard on the connecting cable, and an alarm's gone off. And straight away, I've been like, oh, my God, someone's got an Rad, Where is it? And so it just, like, makes you really jumpy when you're hearing certain things that you associate with the situation. And I think, again, because there is so much graphic content out there and it can really turn people off. And for a long time, I, I didn't look at any of this either. And, you know, I went vegan a long time ago. It's, like, almost 20 years ago now that I went vegan. And I think when I started, I would try and, like, absorbed so much of that that it got to the point where I couldn't really look at a lot of it anymore so I just didn't but I do think it's important to kind of keep up to date with what's happening and continue to see this but I get that a lot of people won't do that and I what I wanted to try and do and again it's how I did it with Sea Shepherd where when I was advocating to end whaling People would ask me, oh, so what's it like in Antarctica then? What's it like going up against the whaling fleet? And I was like, I've got no idea, you know, actually. Uh, maybe I should go and experience that myself so I can talk to people about it and, you know, share some of the stories from 
you know, time with the crew and the different experiences that people have of this. And I found it certainly with Viva Investigations, when we did the fish stuff, people just don't relate to fish. They don't have any recognizable facial expressions or forms of communication. We can't, you know, just say, we can't do with any animal really, just say, hey, you okay? And fish be like, mom, no, I'm not really actually. Can you get me out of here? And so what I really wanted to do was to tell a story from my perspective, why I find fish so incredibly fascinating and why I think other people should find fish fascinating and and stop eating them and recognize that they have an equal right to a fulfilling life and that they're sentient beings in their, their own respect. And it's just developing that. And so, you know, not everything will be the same. I could do you know, be part of a dairy investigation next week and then, you know, have a completely different take on it. It just really depends on who I'm speaking to, what the aim of the investigation is, what the purpose of the campaign is, and learning to develop ways to just resonate with people and communicate with people. And I think that's why, you know, having good communication skills are probably a key part of being an advocate for animals as well, because you need to chat to people and get them to understand why certain things are so terrible when we've been just we have this idea ingrained in us that it's okay to eat pigs but it's not okay to eat dogs for example you know you've got to have a way to start getting people to question that a little bit more and you know I just kind of bumble along (laughs) until I find the right thing that would possibly connect with someone not everybody's interested in animals it could be the environmental damage that animal agriculture causes that, you know, is of particular interest to somebody, or it could be the health benefits of going vegan that's of particular interest. And so, yeah, it's just a matter of finding that way in and then just talking until (laughs) it goes through, I suppose. Yeah, I think that's great with, especially with with you just explaining about the sensory elements, you know, and that's such a thing because um, when you start talking about smells, you know, makes it makes me relate to things that I've smelled in the past and like with the, the hearing as well, you know, I think they're great things and I, maybe they're not used enough. I think in some mm. of the advocacy things I see come out, you know, yeah. we can talk about that personal deep connection, the emotional connection, but also just adding in those, those true experiences that, you know, have touched you sensory. Like, yeah, I think that's a, it's a good thing to keep in mind folks when you're putting out uh, any of your activism <laughs> right now, you know, like uh, how it really not just made you you feel, but how it made you feel. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Definitely. I think as well with with farming, so much of it is is hidden. Um, I mean, before I went and before I went vegan, like, I, and as Gareth said, you know, I, I I spent almost two decades in in the dairy industry, and so I knew about the individuality of cows mm-hmm. and calves. You know, I know they're very very different personalities, and yet. I never, it wasn't until I went vegan and actually had encounters with uh, with sheep and chickens and, you know, and, and all of those. Once you develop that connection, it's like before that, I knew that cows were all different, but sheep were all yeah. the same. You know, oh, they all look the same. Chickens all look the same. You know, they, <laughs> you don't consider, and the same with fish, you don't consider them having different personality, different mm-hmm. needs or just being individuals at all. And all the time this is hidden, you know, how can yeah. we expect people to, to make that connection and, and, and to learn? So, um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, God, we could keep talking to you all day, but, but we, we first heard about you, um, you know, well, our first sort of personal encounter with you anyway was during one of the sentient sessions, mm. which I think that was last year, wasn't it? Was it really just last year? Oh, you know, time is just all muddled together with COVID, hasn't it? <laughs> Who knows? It could have been last year, could have been three years ago. <laughs> I think it was last year that um, our partners at Sentient Media um, hosted a brilliant event where um, you spoke on the challenges of reporting at sea yeah. alongside Ian Abina and Pete Paxton, who um, we're very excited to have him joining us on the show in the future as well. And during the introduction, you spoke a little about your history with Sea Shepherd and how that routine was a key part in keeping you on board for so long. Must have been that methodical, you know, yeah. part of your <laughs> habit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, routine and discipline is often a theme that we see when it comes to longevity within the movement. And it's often the prescribed treatment from activist to activist um, when dealing with burnout or, mm-hmm. you know, secondary trauma, which is, is so common um, among us. And, um, you know, obviously you've been back on land for a while now, but we were wondering if you still kind of 
keep up a, a, a routine as much as you can as a form of self-care and to still be as effective as possible for the animals? Yeah, so I think for a long time, like I would have considered myself a, an anarchist and then <laughs> I joined a ship and I was like, I like rules and regulations <laughs> and I am going to follow the same routine every single day. And that's what my life became. It became, I am such a creature of habit. There's no point denying it any longer. I like a good rule and I like a good set of guidelines to stick to. I'm quite a stickler for it actually now. Um, but I do find that I can tell when I'm starting to get to a point where I need to take time out. I just, I recognize the sort of symptoms that you can get from secondary trauma. I get quite agitated. I get quite angry over nothing. I can start feeling really sad about nothing. Like it can be the slightest little thing. And I'm like, I just want to go home. So I think it's really important for me to watch a lot of friends. And I've, I've talked about this before as well. Friends is like my go-to. Whenever I feel crappy about anything, I stick a bit of friends on. I know it is dated and I know a lot of the jokes and friends would not be okay <laughs> if they were made today. But, you know, I didn't recognize the problems with it, but it's helped me through some really difficult times when I've struggled with the amount of terrible things that happen in the world. And I've just sat down and I've got a bit of like Joey going, how you doing? And I'm like, That's you know the first what? thing I thought <laughs> And I'm like, I'm not doing okay, Joey. <laughs> um, but yeah, Friends gets me through a lot. I love Jennifer Aniston. I love everything she's in. Um, so I'm kind of burning through all of the morning show at the moment. But that's besides the point. I guess... Being out in nature is really important to me. I love going bird watching and just being around trees. 2020 for me was like the year of the tree. I bought myself a tree book and I was like, I'm gonna learn trees. And it was really fun. And I spent the winter just like trying to distinguish between the different buds of trees and it gave me a focus. And I think that's what's really important is to just do something that brings you some enjoyment and you can recognize good things in the world and you can be in the middle of the forest and think yeah okay we're gonna be all right again and you know that's just what keeps me going on to the next day and you know trying to do mm -hmm. a little bit more of what I've been doing and and hopefully making some kind of impact somewhere along the way yeah. I love that yeah. and yeah I <laughs> made me chuckle because when you said you know I turned to friends I thought you meant your physical friends oh, no. <laughs> so many people no. say that you know I hang out with other activists or whatever but no friends friends no I'm people. talking the tv show friends <laughs> it's brilliant it's brilliant well, I have to admit so, we watched that not too long ago as well yeah. Didn't it? so yeah it's still quite fresh in my mind I think yeah. um it's, it's one of those things though like suffering is inherent in this field um especially if you're working full-time in it Mm -hmm. But it's like that sort of saying about, you know, an artist must suffer for the work. And that's not true. You know, we've got to have some, yeah. you know, some escape from that. Because, yeah, like as you say about the symptoms, you know, I was thinking about, mm -hmm. yeah, just a couple of weeks is going going through that ourselves as well. And it's just you've got to be you've got to be there for the longevity for the animals. Yeah. Because once again, you know, we can rush headlong and absolutely burn out, crash, not help, only help a handful of animals. But if we can stick with it keep ourselves going um then we're going to help a lot more in the long run and uh we do something that many people think is crazy but we get up every morning at 5 a.m uh that is week, crazy you know. <laughs> yeah but like we really love it um i suppose we're both kind of early birds but you know it's kind of we get up at 5 a.m we spend the first sort of two hours of our day on just you know meditating yeah. yoga walking we never thought we'd be the yoga people but yeah i'm still like, trying oh, to do that <laughs> It, it's really it's great and it's, it's not just for like soccer moms and like uh, full-on <laughs> yogis you know like anyone can do it um but you know we spend that couple of hours every morning starting off our day that way and it just makes everything so much better because then i can prepare myself if i'm working on say a documentary or anything like that that has a lot of that graphic footage because i've taken that time to find myself first before i throw yeah. myself out there into that chaotic uh, will that is you know um everything that we're doing for the animals and what's more so what's been done to the animals so you know yeah. really everyone out there watching this 
think about a routine. Don't you don't have to do what we do. Um, <laughs> watch Friends, do that, um, but not wake up at five a.m. But you know, <laughs> make sure that you're doing something for yourself because you yeah. are an animal at the end of the day, and we've all got to be Absolutely. for the animals. Just not put the preference on yourself. Put the preference on the the other animals. But yeah, yeah. do something for yourself. It's yeah. so important. But absolutely, Viva continues though to just create so many great initiatives and campaigns for the animals. Um, we just love everything that you do. We're just so happy to be able to collaborate with you guys so much. Um, it brings us so much joy. You and Julia are just fantastic. We loved having you on the show. And yes. is there anything else that you're working on right now that you'd like to share with our audience or any sneaky hints as to what we might see in the future? Yeah. Oh, uh, well, you know, thank you for those kind words because that is it's really nice and it's really appreciated because we do have such an incredible team at Beaver. Well, I think we've got about 24 staff now. Like it fluctuates a little bit. So I'm always like, is it near a 30? Is it near a but I think it's about 24 now. And the team work so hard. And it was the same with Hogwood. You know, we had the investigations team that generally took a lot of credit for just getting the footage. But, you know, they weren't the only people involved in, in that whole campaign. We've got everybody working flat out, putting materials together, posting the materials, sorting out days of action. It was just real collaboration in action. And it was absolutely brilliant to be a part of that. So, yes, it, you know, we do have a lot going on. This is a very small team, but we've got some of the stuff we've got coming up. We've just got a new environment campaign and she's absolutely wonderful. She's so good. And so in the summer, we're going to be taking a like little step away from animals. Not entirely, but we'll be doing more on the environmental side again and kind of reigniting the whole vegan now message from that. We've got a lot of really exciting stuff coming up. But next week, we'll actually be out doing our license to kill street actions. So, yeah, a lot on the fish front in this kind of quarter of the year as well, which I'm really personally really excited about because I just love getting to talk about fish all the time. And, yeah, and like I feel bad for sea lice, though, because they are incredible as well. Like, I feel like we're <laughs> making them out to be the enemy, but they're not. They're amazing. It's just unfortunate that we have these awful awful places where they've become a real real problem and it's not good so we're going to be out on the streets of britain talking to the general public and trying to encourage them to stop eating fish fantastic well i hope everyone is going to be keeping an eye out for that once again there will be links in the description of this video to do it go over to viva and check out the amazing work you're doing lex it's just and the whole team, shall I say, Definitely. it is just, yeah, it fills our hearts with joy to have you on here. And it's just been such a great discussion. I hope uh, my audience have got more interested in doing investigations as well, because as we say, crucial part is shutting down this industry piece by piece. And hopefully, you know, we can get it completely done. So I can't thank you enough for being oh, on the show. Yeah. Thank you so much. And, you know, if you want to see and hear more from Lex as well, firstly, I should have said before, I highly recommend our viewers check out mm. the recording of uh, the challenges of reporting at sea. Uh, <laughs> it was either in video or podcast format. It's such a brilliant discussion between you, Ian and Peter, mm. and you can fight that, find it. You can find that on the Sentient Media website. But Lex is also a brilliant host of the Viva podcast. Um, so I would really encourage all our followers to go and and, uh, and follow that as well and tune in because we have some brilliant discussions and it's, it's so well done. So um, thank, thank you for you. everything that you do, for Viva, for the fish, for everything. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure to chat to you both today. And thank you for getting up so early, <laughs> even though I now know it's part of your uh, routine. But yeah, thanks for taking the time to chat today. Mm -hmm.